Wilhelm Röntgen had worked on a variety of topics in physics, specific heat of gases, thermal conductivity of crystals, polarisation of light, electrical characteristics of quartz, and compressibility of fluids. He was now in 1895 Professor of Physics and Director of the Physical Institute at the University of Würzburg, and he took an interest in the developing field of cathode rays. Röntgen liked to repeat the experiments of others when he entered a new field, and he was operating a Leonard tube, a discharge tube with a thin aluminium window that allowed cathode rays to escape to the outside. He covered the tube with a black card to shield its fluorescent glow so he could check some of Leonard's work and notice that a barium platino cyanide screen lying nearby became fluorescent. He soon realised he was dealing not just with cathode rays but with a new phenomenon. This discovery was made on the evening of 8th of November 1895 and he worked in secret for the next seven weeks investigating the properties of these new rays with a fluorescent screen and then photographic plates. He found that the rays originated from the fluorescing area of the tube and later from an aluminium target if he introduced one and that they travelled several metres through air. But his most striking discovery was that these X-rays, as he called them, could pass through objects and affected photographic plates. He made radiographs of a set of weights, a piece of metal, and the bones of his wife's hand. He handed his first paper to the President of the Physical Medical Society of Würzburg on 28th of December 1895 and it was immediately printed and distributed. Word spread quickly and since every laboratory of consequence already had the equipment necessary to study cathode rays they could produce x-rays and Röntgen's discovery was quickly confirmed. In 1896 alone, some 50 books and pamphlets and nearly 1,000 papers were published on X-rays. The term skiograph, shadow picture, was used for a while, but radiograph was soon widely adopted. The archives of clinical skiography were started in May 1896 and its title became The Archives of the Röntgen Ray in 1897. He was awarded the first ever Nobel Prize for Physics in 1901 for his discovery and the investigation of X-rays. Strangely, soon afterwards he gave up any continued work on the subject and returned to his old interests. In England, medical opinion on the potential value of X-rays, sceptical at first, was swayed by lectures, notably one by Sylvanus Thompson at the Medical Society of London on 31st of March. In February, the British Medical Journal commissioned Sidney Rowland to investigate and he then produced 13 influential weekly reports between February and June. By the end of 1896, X-ray tubes had been improved vastly. The focus tube was developed by Herbert Jackson. Its concave cathode directed the cathode rays into a small spot on a target anode set at 45 degrees giving much sharper pictures. It was established that the best target materials were those of high atomic weight and that platinum was the best practical material. Tungsten and uranium were better experimentally 
but these were more difficult to work with. Platinum was generally used in a thin layer on nickel because of cost. Initially, those experimenting with X-rays had to construct their own equipment from scratch, but the interest was so great that within just a year of the discovery, the American General Electric Company had produced a catalogue of X-ray equipment, although it was still necessary to assemble the parts yourself. The early X-ray tubes depended on the presence of some residual gas. They became called gas tubes for the electric discharge to take place. It was the positive ions colliding with the cathode that produced most of the electrons. In operation, some of the gas became absorbed onto the inside of the tube, increasing the vacuum. This led to the tube becoming harder. A higher voltage was required and the X-rays became more penetrating while their intensity de decreased. A number of systems for keeping the pressure in the tubes nearly constant were devised. Some involved heating palladium membranes and allowing hydrogen to permeate into X-ray tubes. Others used heat to release absorbed gases from mica and charcoal. By 1900, automatic regulation was possible using an auxiliary spark to heat mica and release absorbed gases. However, the popular description of a gas tube as a glass bulb surrounded by profanity was appropriate for a while yet. The first major advance in X-ray tube design was not to come until the invention of the modern high vacuum thermionic tube by William David Coolidge in 1913. Coolidge had found a way of making the metal tungsten suitable for use as a filament in electric light bulbs, and he introduced a tungsten filament as the cathode. This, when heated by passing an electric current through it, gave off a reliable supply of electrons. When the vacuum was improved, no ionisation of gas was necessary to create the, the electrons at the cathode. Coolidge had a reliable tube that could produce copious and controllable x-rays. Mind you, the first time he tried it, much of his hair fell out. The intensifying screen was suggested by Campbell Swinton in January 1896. And in April he found that, with a photographic plate in contact with a fluorescent screen, it was possible to get an image of a hand in a few seconds rather than one to two minutes. The image quality was not very good and he discovered that a finely powdered screen material gave good resolution but poor response. Increasing the powder grain size improved the response but the resolution deteriorated. However, it was to be a long time before the intensifying screen was developed and used routinely. Röntgen's original discovery led directly to the fluoroscope. In this simple device, a fluorescent screen covered the end of a light-tight box and it could be observed through an eyepiece. This meant that the shadow pictures could be observed in daylight. It was one of the most used devices in the early days of X-rays, with the advantage of simplicity and the immediacy of real-time observation. It was developed as the handheld cryptoscope by Professor Enrico Salvioni of Perugia, and by February 1896 several UK investigators had built copies. It was improved by Edison, who selected calcium tungstate as the best screen material and coined the name fluoroscope. He later characteristically claimed the invention altogether. It was common practice for a radiologist to check a setup by putting his own hand between the X-ray tube and the screen and checking the image 
a practice that was to be the cause of much pain and suffering later on. The explosion of interests in the Rays meant that exploitation far outstripped understanding. And when potential hazards were seen, they were widely ignored. So the absence of shielding around the early X-ray tubes resulted in considerable injury to the operator. And the problem was compounded by the common practice of operators looking at their own hand with a fluorescent screen to test the apparatus. By 1902, John Paul Edwards was developing painful sores and warts, and a photograph of chronic dermatitis, printed in the archives of the Röntgen Ray, of which he became editor in 1903, was probably of his own hands. At the annual meeting of the BMA, held in Oxford in 1904, Hall Edwards described his condition and this was subsequently published in the British Medical Journal. In this illustrated article about his own conditions, he strongly urged young workers to take every possible precaution before it became too late. The pain was, he said, as if bones were being gnawed away by rats. By 1906 his left arm was useless and carried in a sling. In 1908, when cancerous growths were found, his left arm was amputated just below the elbow, and the fingers of his right hand were removed. He advised caution, and went on to become a Birmingham city councillor before dying in 1926. In the USA, the case of Clarence Daly received wide publicity, and had great impact. Daly had joined Edison after he left the US Navy, where he'd been a chief gunner's mate. A little fellow, but a specimen of perfect manhood, according to his surgeon. He worked with Edison from 1896 and was responsible for testing tubes and assisting Edison with his X-ray development. For the tube testing, he often placed his hand between the fluoroscope and the tube. His hair soon began to fall out, his face wrinkled and his hands developed dermatitis. The skin condition worsened over several years, leading to failure of the blood vessels in his left arm, and a cancerous condition developed. By 1901, it was necessary to amputate his left arm, and in, in 1903, fingers were removed from his right hand. The right arm was later amputated. The experience caused Edison to give up work on radiation. He abandoned work on a fluorescent lamp based on radioactive material and said, I could make the lamp all right, but when I did so, I found that it would kill everybody who would use it continuously. These were just two of the many X-ray workers who suffered delayed but appalling injuries from X-rays. In 1936, a memorial was erected in Hamburg to 169 pioneers of X-rays who suffered radiation injury or lost their lives due to their work. For several years after Röntgen's discovery, injuries were usually seen as temporary and superficial, but by about 1905, most workers were taking some precautions. With the increasingly powerful X-ray setups available, it became ever more important. Since that common practice of checking a setup by placing the hand in front of the fluorescent screen was probably the biggest cause of injury, the invention of the chiroscope in 1903 must have made some difference. This was a skeleton hand with simulated flesh mounted behind a fluorescent screen. The osteoscope was a similar device using a complete forearm. Shielding of the tube was unusual before about 1908 but some practitioners were careful throughout. 
Francis Williams of Boston can be seen with a protective box around the tube in a 1902 photograph. And he remarked later that he thought penetrating rays like X-rays must have some effect upon the human system and took precautions accordingly. Williams's early caution came from his brother-in-law and collaborator, the remarkable William Rollins. Rollins, a Boston dentist, stood for what we would now call a precautionary approach to X-ray safety. One explanation for the damage caused by X-ray machines was that, was that it was not the X-rays that were dangerous, but the high voltages and high electric fields surrounding the equipment that were the problem. Rollins put a guinea pig in a Faraday chamber, a set of electrically earthed boxes that excluded any electric fields, and exposed it to an X-ray source outside the box. The exposure lasted two hours per day, and after 11 days, the guinea pig died. A second died after similar treatment after eight days. It led Rollins to propose three precautions. Physicians should wear glasses that keep out x-rays when using fluoroscopes. X-ray tubes should be kept in sealed boxes with a small window to give a cone of radiation no larger than needed. Patients should be shielded except where necessary for examination. Or treatment. Protective gloves and aprons became routine in Britain in about 1905. In, in 1908, Hall Edwards published a list of ten rules which included shielding the tube with a small aperture opposite the patient, shielding of the operator by a movable panel, keeping your distance from the tube, and using an opaque apron and lead glass spectacles when viewing a fluorescent screen. He emphasised also that the effect of X-ray exposure was cumulative. The skin was clearly the organ most damaged by X-rays and some practitioners made use of the filter devised by George Fowler in 1905 to protect themselves and patients. This simple disc of leather removed the less penetrating rays that damaged the skin, but allowed the more penetrating ones that produced the radiograph through. This was of course not all good news. Some therapeutic irradiations had been limited by skin reactions, and when these were reduced, much higher doses could be delivered to deeper tissues. So, by perhaps 1910, the dangers of acute and disastrous tissue damage were widely recognised and there were some straightforward protection measures being adopted. The means of measuring larger doses were available and were used for control of patient exposures. Together these things could, if sensibly applied, reduce and perhaps eliminate the dreadful acute effects and within a few years, professional bodies would step in with just such recommendations. However, many of the early workers were to die because of their injuries, and even more were to suffer and die from unsuspected long-term effects that were a long way from being understood. <laughs>